This is Cerebral Cinema. Movies of the Mind. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another story about his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And incidentally, I'd like to tell you about a swell American custom. The custom of serving sherry wine just before dinner. Petri California sherry. You know, especially when you have guests, while you're waiting for that call to the dinner table, there's nothing better than a good glass of that good Petri sherry. You don't need fancy glasses for Petri sherry. No, sir. That wine tastes good out of any glass. And it looks good, too. Beautifully clear and the color of precious amber. Just try that Petri sherry and you'll feel like smacking your lips after every sip. Oh, and say, Petri makes two kinds of sherry. The regular sherry and Petri pale dry sherry. Just to make sure you get the perfect sherry for the whole family, don't buy one, buy two. But do be sure the sherry you buy is Petri sherry. Petri, the proudest name in the history of American wines. And now I'm sure our good friend Dr. Watson's ready for us. Let's go in and join him. Come in, come in, come in. Oh, there you are, Mr. Bartell. Good evening, Doctor. Say, where are the puppies this evening? Mr. Bartell, don't you think it's about time you began to refer to them as the dogs? They're almost a year old, you know. <laughs> I stand corrected. Where are the dogs this evening? Well, they had another furious battle with a dead seal on the beach today. My housekeeper, Mrs. West, is giving them a much-needed bath. <laughs> They certainly have an aversion to seals, don't they? Well, Doctor, are you all ready with tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure? Yes, my boy, and as yesterday was St. Patrick's Day, I decided to tell you a story that took place in Ireland uh, a few years before the turn of the century. I imagine that you've heard of kissing the Blarney Stone, haven't you? Oh, yes, Doctor, though I've never understood exactly what it meant. Well, let me explain it to you, because the ceremony plays a, a very important part in the story tonight. Blarney Castle is an imposing 15th century ruin a few miles outside the town of Cork. The castle is many stories high, and in the foremost tower, the famous Blarney Stone is, is situated. What's supposed to be the point in kissing it, Doctor? The stone is considered a powerful talisman, and the legend runs that whoever kisses it is endowed with eloquence for life. <laughs> Say, Doctor, if I ever get over to Ireland, I'll certainly kiss that stone. But you're such a storyteller yourself, Doctor. I... How about you've kissed it, huh? No, Mr. Bartell. I'm afraid I never had quite enough courage. Courage? Well, why does it need courage, Doctor? Well, because the Blarney Stone is, is set in a most inaccessible position on the outside wall. To kiss it, it is customary to lower the candidate for eloquence over the rampart, head foremost, with a friend hanging on to his heels. From the top of a castle? It does sound dangerous, Doctor. Well, it was, my boy. So much so that in recent years, a great row of iron spikes was put round the parapet to prevent an accident. Though, of course, at the time tonight's story took place, there was no such guard. And I have a feeling that an accident did take place, no, Doctor. No, 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 Mr. Bartell. Let me tell you the story from the beginning. Sherlock Holmes and I were staying in the city of Cork, where the great man had just solved the singular affair which the local press had referred to as the Leprechaun Murders. A few days before our departure for England, we paid a visit to Blarney Castle. I must confess that I had a certain desire to test the miraculous powers attributed to the Blarney Stone. I very soon changed my mind, however, as Holmes and I stood there, high on the turrets of Blarney Castle, and watched a terrified initiate being hauled up by his ankles and yelling at the top of his voice. Pull me up! Pull me up quickly! I think I'm going to faint! Great, Scott. I had no idea that kissing the Barney Stone was such a hazardous proceeding, huh? Yes. It would seem that eloquence could be more easily obtained than by hanging it suspended by one's ankles from a battlement with a hundred foot drop below and kissing a piece of stone. Oh, I'll never do that again. Oh, I'll never, never I must do say, that. I don't blame the fuller. <laughs> and yet, my dear chap, on our way over here, you expressed a sneaking desire to kiss the stone yourself. I'll be very happy to hold your ankles if you want to try the experiment. No, no, thank you. After witnessing the ceremony, I've changed my mind. Then I suggest we make our way back downstairs. I don't think there's much more to be seen up here. Well, by the way, Holmes, do you know the origin of the superstition regarding the, the Blarney Stone? Yes, I do, old chap. The stone was, um, <clears throat> the story of the stone dates back 
to the middle of the 15th century. A certain Cormac McCarthy called the Strong, a descendant of the ancient kings of Munster and builder of this castle, chanced one day to save an old woman from drowning. In her gratitude, she offered Cormac a golden tongue, which would have the power to influence men and women, friends and foes, as he willed. She told him to mount the battlement and kiss a certain stone in the wall five feet below the gallery running around the top. He followed her directions and obtained all the fluent persuasiveness she had promised. And I suppose the story spread and the Blarney Stone has been a magnet to pilgrims ever since. Yeah, that's pleasant legend. Uh, Holmes. Yes, old chap? Tomorrow's St. Patrick's Day. I, I bet there'll be quite a bit of excitement in the village tonight. Don't you think it'd be rather fun to pay a visit to one of the local inns? Splendid idea, old chap. Our rather arduous work here in Ireland is concluded and I think we're more than entitled to a little gaiety. <laughs> Charming, quite charming. A waiter and singing at his work. Singing very well, too. Just the same. I wish someone would come and take our order. Oh, there's a barmaid. I'll see if I can catch her eye. Hi. Uh, miss? Miss? Would you gentlemen be after wanting something? Yes, my dear. My friend and I would like a little refreshment. And what would you suggest? What would I suggest, Your Honor? Oh, big God. Uh, there's but one drink a gentleman like yourself should be after pouring down you. And that's the cream of Connemora. Whiskey that'll soften your heart and, and make you glow with a good feeling so... So that the little people will be after visiting you. <laughs> it sounds delightful. Bring two glasses, will you? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. I, I must say, I never heard an English barmaid go into such rhapsodies over a nip of whiskey. No, the Irish are distinctly more colorful in their speech. It's an interesting fact, though, Watson, that uh, the Irish are curiously unrewarding in the criminal world. England, Scotland, America, Australia have all produced classics of crime. But the Irish murders, almost without exception, have been purely physical... Affairs of hot blood. You say that rather regretfully, Holmes. No, my dear chap. No, no, no. I say, Watson, look at this rather florid-looking gentleman coming towards our table. Oh, it looks to me as if he's a little under the weather. You fellows have got to have a drink with me. Oh, thank you, sir, thank you, but we've just ordered one. Well, you've got to have it with me. I went to the races at Cork today and made a killing. I'm going to buy all the drinks here tonight. I'm afraid that... Uh, Nothing to not... be afraid of. I'll, I'll, I'll sit down with you for a moment. There. My name's... Hankin, Jeffrey Hankin. What's yours? <laughs> Mine is Holmes, and this is my friend, Dr. Watson. How do you do, How do, do, do you do, sir? How do you do? Your honors, uh, that'll be one and six. Here, I'm paying for these here. Half a crown, and you can keep oh, the change. Oh, oh, blessings you, on you, Your Honor. Oh, well, if you insist on paying for our drinks, Mr. Hankin, here's your very yeah, good health. Yes, indeed. You're, uh, you're both English, aren't you? Yes, sir. So am I, and it's certainly a relief to hear an English voice again. Oh, you don't like the Irish lilt, sir? Can't bear it. <laughs> Personally, I find it rather charming. Yes, indeed, so do I. Well, you wouldn't if you had to live with it all the time. Sometimes I think that if I hear one more Irish tenor singing Molly Malone or one more reference to the little people, I shall go raving mad. <laughs> you live in Ireland, sir? Yeah, I have to. I own a half interest in the tweed mill here, you see. In any case, my wife's Irish and she thinks there's no other country in the world, so I suppose I'm stuck here. Uh, see that couple sitting at the table over there? You mean the fellow with a with very beautiful girl? yes. Man's Michael Corker and my partner. Oh, the girl's absolutely ravishing. <laughs> You'd like to meet her? I'd like to, my George, yes. What, what do you say, Holmes? Oh, very well, Watson. The combination of my natural curiosity and your taste for a pretty face would um, seem to suit the occasion admirably. Yes, I might as well warn you, Doctor, that the pretty face belongs to my wife. Your wife? Oh, good gracious me. I'm mean, sorry, sorry. I, I, I didn't mean to. Oh, well, you better bring your glasses with you. <laughs> Molly, my dear, I want you to meet two English friends of mine, Mr. Holmes and uh, Dr. Watson. How do you oh, do? How do you do, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson? Won't you sit down and join us? And this is my partner, Michael Corker. Now, how do you do, Mr. Corcoran? How do you do, sir? I'm glad to meet you. Please be seated, gentlemen. Are you visiting here in Cork, Mr. Uh, yes, Holmes? Mrs. Hankin, but uh, we're returning to England in a few days. You've been to Blarney Castle, I hope. Oh, oh yes, we were there this afternoon. And uh, did either of you have the courage to kiss the Blarney Stone? No, no, we didn't. I'm afraid it's an athletic feat that's beyond me. <laughs> it's a lot of rubbish, that's <laughs> what it is. <laughs> Kissing a slab of stone. Uh, have you the courage to do it, Geoffrey? Well, of course I have, but I don't want to make a fool of myself. Where's the barmaid? 
Kathleen. I'll make a wager, Jeffrey, that you haven't the courage to kiss the stone. How much shall you bet, Michael? I'll wager a ten-pound note on it. It's a bet, and you fellows witnessed it. I'll kiss the Blarney Stone at noon tomorrow, and you'll be ten pounds the poorer, Michael. And I suggest that Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson be present as well. They can act as referees. But Jeffrey, dear, don't get so excited. Well, I don't like it when Michael suggests I don't have courage. You want some more drink, Mr. Henry? Yes, all of us want some more. Uh, no more for me, thank you, Mr. No, 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 no more for and me, I thank you. And I think you've had enough, Jeffrey. Don't tell me when I've had enough, Molly. In Dublin, fair city, the girls... Oh, no, not that filthy song. Yes, yes Mr. Hankin, I find the traditional Irish melodies quite beautiful. And I find them revolted. Stop! Jeffrey, quiet. Would your honor be wanting me to sing another song? My honor would like you to shut up that filthy caterwaul. Really, sir, really, oh, I call it Mr. Goldberg. Uh, Sean... Please go on with your singing. In Dublin's fair city... You heard me, you great bog trotting gazoon. I said shut up, and I meant shut up! Oh. Jeffrey, I'm leaving here at once. Michael, please to take me home. It'll be my pleasure, Molly. You're an ugly man, Mr. Henkin. Knocking down poor Sean when he was singing just like a bird. Oh, the devil with him, and all of you. No Irishman will be after forgiving you for this night's work. No, not the little people of old Ireland either. You've made more enemies, Mr. Hankin, than you'll ever see. But you'll be knowing they're there. Fiddlesticks, you can't frighten me with your stupid Irish superstition. Well, bless my soul, that was a charming little party, I, I must say. Englishmen like Hankin are a disgrace to their country. Fortunately, they're not representative, though. Yes, I must say, I'd hate to have a curse put on me like that barmaid laid on him. Watson. Yes? Did you see the glances which Mr. Hankins' partner and his wife exchanged as the brawl started? There was more menace to him in those glances than in all the threats of all the little people in Ireland. Yes. I thought that there was something between them. I say, Holmes, that bet about Hankin kissing the Blarney Stone at noon tomorrow, do you suppose... I suppose that... nothing, old fellow. But there are forces at work here that I don't like. I think, Watson, that uh, you and I will be at the Blarney Stone at noon tomorrow. It's possible that the bet made tonight is all part of a definite plan, and I have a feeling that the bet is still on. Quite windy up here today, old fellow, at the top of the tower, isn't it? Yes, it's just past noon. I wonder if that man Hankin is going to keep to the terms of his bed. We shall soon learn. In the meanwhile, are you sure that you wouldn't like to change your mind and kiss the Blarney Stone no, yourself? I'm quite sure, thank you. Ah, here they come now. Yes. Hankin and his partner, Mr. Corcoran. The bet is on, Watson. Good day to you, gentlemen. Oh, hello. My friends from last night. Well, I see you're going through with the bet, son. Oh, yes. Jeffrey set his mind on the ten pounds of mine. Your wife didn't accompany you, Mr. Hankin. No, she didn't. I'm afraid I'm rather in disgrace for my behavior last night. Molly made me go around and see that waiter fellow that I hit. I offered him money, but he wouldn't take it. Right. Did you offer him an apology? Apologize? To a waiter? I should say not. Well, come on. Let's get this stupid farce over with. Yeah. Are you sure your nerves can stand it, Jeffrey? There's a drop of a hundred feet or more below you. Oh, don't worry about me, Michael. Just hold on to my ankles tightly and don't let go. I'll climb onto the parapet. There we are. Now hold on to my feet, Michael, and lower me gently. Uh, I'm holding you, Jeffrey. Then lower away. Uh, right you are, Jeffrey. Great Scott, I wouldn't do that for a hundred pounds. Sliding head first down a vertical wall. That's enough, Michael. I can reach the stone. Oh, his boots. They're slipping through my fingers. I can't hold Here, him. Let me help you. I'm slipping. Hold him. Hold on to him. Hold on to him. Oh, he's gone. I just couldn't hold him. Great heavens. No man could survive that drop. Mr. Cochran, you deliberately let your partner slip to his death. This is murder. Yeah. But I don't understand. I, I'm a strong man. But he just vanished out of my hands like... Like a grease pig. Let me see your hands, Mr. Corcoran. This is dreadful. Dreadful. There's grease on your hands. Grease. And with a faint trace of boot blacking. Good Lord, Holmes. That it means, means that... Watson, that someone, knowing that Hankin was going to kiss the Blarney Stone, smeared his boots with grease so that he would slip out of the grasp of whoever was holding him. As clever a method of indirect long-distance murder as ever I've encountered. <laughs> Do 
You'll hear the remainder of Dr. Watson's story in just a second, so I'm going to remind you that Petri California Sherry is not only wonderful before dinner, but it's good almost any time. If you had to choose just one wine for almost any occasion, that wine would be Petri Sherry. Petri Sherry is a perfect wine to serve in the afternoon or in the evening. It's good before dinner, yes, but it's swell after dinner, too. In fact, with a bottle of Petri Sherry on your shelf, you've got practically a small-sized wine cellar. So get a bottle of Petri Sherry soon. And remember, you can't miss with any wine that has the letters P-E-T-R-I on the label because all Petri wine is good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, this is quite a story you're telling us tonight. Uh, What happened next? I suppose you went down into the castle grounds and looked for the dead man's body? Well, we tried to, Mr. Bartell, but the authorities were curiously uncooperative. They refused to let us search, insisting that the police be called first. And so, Mr. Bartell, half an hour after the tragedy, Holmes and I found ourselves standing in a tiny police station as we told the story to the local sergeant. I should the saints be prayers, Mr. Holmes. It is a terrible story, you've told me. Tomorrow I'll be after arresting Sean O'Flaherty. Sean O'Flaherty, He's the waiter at the inn, the one who sings. That he is, that he is, and he sings like a breath of spring. I'll be sorry to see him hang. But to you, you've got no proof that he was responsible for the murder? Proof, you say, sir? Well, I can't arrest a big man, a factory man like Mr. Cochran, can I? Or a fine lady like Mrs. Hank. But you can't arrest a man without any evidence of guilt. Oh, I can't, can't I? Then suppose I tell you that Sean O'Flaherty cleans the boats at the hotel where Mr. Hank was staying. He does, eh? Then he had the perfect opportunity for the greasing of Hampkins' boots this morning. And we know he had a motive for harming him. You're right, sir. And from what I have heard of the dead man's behavior last night, half a dozen people could have heard him make the bet that he'd kiss the Blarney Stone today. Sean O'Friday's our man. I'll have to arrest him tomorrow. Tomorrow? But good heavens, man, aren't you going to do something today? A murderer is at large. Today is blessed St. Patrick's Day. Oh, I should let the poor fellow have the day in peace. Oh, he won't run away. But, my dear sir... Uh, will you come back with me to the castle and search for the body? They refuse to let me do it alone. On St. Patrick's Day? That I will not. We would need a crew of helpers. And where will I be after getting them on blessed St. Patrick's Day? <laughs> no, no, I will do that tomorrow, too. No, today is a day for celebrating. Oh, your, your methods astound me, Sergeant. Oh, do they now, sir? <laughs> Don't be after fretting about me. Just enjoy yourself today. Tomorrow we'll see what can be done about it. Well, good day to you, gentlemen. Oh, bless my soul. I've never seen such a happy-go-lucky policeman in my life. It's infuriating. If only I were allowed to examine Hankins' body, I could get to the bottom of this. Well, what are you going to do now, Holmes? The police won't help us. Then we must take the law into our own hands. I think we'll start off by going to the hotel and seeing what we can find out from Sean O'Flaherty. <laughs> Well, in your day, I well remember for to view the lads and lasses on the 5th day of November with a marine do a day and a marine a do a daddy. Oh, your honors would be after speaking to me, Sean O'Flaherty, perhaps. Yes, Sean. Did you know that Mr. Hankin, the man who struck you last night, was dead? Dead? Well, if ever a man deserved to be beneath the sod, was Jeffrey Hankin himself. A mean, ugly man. The saints be praised that he's gone. How did he die, sir? He was murdered. Murdered? Well, but, Dad, I'm not surprised to hear it. Who murdered him, sir? At the moment, the police seem to think that uh, you are the culprit. Myself? Well, how would I be after murdering the man, sir, when I don't even know how he died? He died when he fell from the top of Blarney Castle as he was trying to kiss the stone. He fell because Mr. Cochran, his partner, couldn't hold on to his feet. His boots had been greased. And we know that you have been cleaning his boots, Sean. That I have, sir. I cleaned them this very morning. But I put no grease on him, if that's what you'd be after suggesting. I'm suggesting nothing. I'm trying to establish a few facts. Do you know Kathleen the barmaid? Oh, and why shouldn't I know her, sir? She's to be my wife before the winter sets in. Uh, She pronounced a curse on the dead man last night, just after he had knocked you down. It's possible that um, she met... Here she comes, huh? Sean, my darling, what are the fine gentlemen doing here? Oh, Kathleen. They've come to ask me questions about the death of Mr. Hankin. He fell off Blarney Castle today and got himself murdered, they say. The saints be praised. But, uh, but what has that to do with you, my darling? Well, the gentlemen tell me that the village police think that I might have greased his boots so that he slipped to his death. The village police is as stupid as my father's big sow. 
If Mr. Hengen fell to his death today because his boots were greased, I can tell you who did it. Indeed, who? The little people. I warned Mr. Hengen last night that the little people would be after him. He insulted the Irish. Oh, come, 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 my dear. You don't seriously expect us to believe in the, in the little people? And why not, Your Honor? We have them here. Oh, oh, there are those say the fairies all be dead, but, but I know different. I've seen them. When I was a slip of a girl, close to where I lived, there was a rat. Uh, uh, that's a fort, you know. And the rat was a fairy's fort. We never dared touch it with a spade or, or cut down a tree growing on it or carry away a stone. We put our ear to the ground at night and, and we could hear the fairy music rising up from under the ground. Ah, oh, they're gentle people. Most of the time. But they'd grease the boots of a man like Mr. Henkin if they didn't like them. That they would, Your Honor. Holmes, I'm certain that we're wasting our time here. I feel so, Watson. You get the whole thing turned on the greasing of those boots. If only I could have the boots in my hands. If only I could make laboratory tests. But until that dolt of a police... But of course! I have it, Watson. You have what, Holmes? The answer, I hope. Get hold of Mrs. Hankin and Mr. Corcoran. Have them meet me in the Blarnestone Tower in half an hour. And you, where are you going? To the police station to try and convince the sergeant that even though it's St. Patrick's Day, it's his duty to help me trap a murderer. <laughs> You know, Mr. Holmes, you're an obstinate man. It's blessed St. Patrick's Day, and yet you insist that we meet here on the top of Blarney Castle. Uh, what do you think you can prove? Who murdered Jeffrey Hankin? Yes, but why do Molly and I have to be here? Yes, Mr. Holmes. And poor Jeffrey's body still lying somewhere below us. Uh, Mrs. Hankin, Mr. Corcoran, I asked Dr. Watson to bring you here for a good reason, I assure you. Are you ready, Watson? Quite ready, Holmes. Uh, good. Sergeant. Uh, yes, sir. You asked me why I've assembled the three of you here. I'm going to reconstruct the crime. I shall play the part of the victim. My friend Dr. Watson will represent you, Mr. Corcoran. Now, I straddle the parapet. So. Now, uh, Watson, hold on to my feet, Will. Uh, I've got him home. And uh, lower me down the face of the wall. Right, you are. Holmes! Holmes, hold tight to the wall. Oh. Try and push yourself back. The murderer's tried to get you. Uh, Your boots are Lord. covered in grease. Oh, Stand back. Come away. Grab oh, oh, my trouser legs, Watson. I, I've got him, Holmes. Come. Oh. Up you come. There, there we go. Oh, a Joe, devilish uh, plot. That was a near thing. Devilish plot, Sergeant. And very cleverly carried out. My boots were ungreased when I entered the castle, and yet someone has been able to apply grease to them without my knowledge within the last few minutes. Sure, and how is that possible, sir? I don't know, Sergeant. I must confess. Holmes. You stumbled as you came up the darkened staircase. Do you remember that? That's true, old chap. I'd forgotten. And you, Mrs. Hankin, and you, Mr. Corcoran, were kind enough to assist me to my feet. An excellent opportunity to apply the grease. Now we know that one of you two is the murderer. I must have a jar of grease somewhere. Now, Sergeant, will you search the lady while I search Mr. Corcoran? But this is ridiculous. Of course it is. How could we be guilty? Well, if you're not guilty, you've got no objection to being searched, ma'am. Well, upon my word, here in your purse, Mrs. Hankin, is a jar of grease. What? Now, what have you to say for yourself? Why oh, can't you say, Sergeant? Except that she engineered her husband's murder and tried to engineer mine. Oh, no. No, I, I knew nothing about Jeffrey's murder. Oh, Michael, darling, I swear to Don't you. Don't worry, my darling. I'll not let them hurt you. I'm telling you, you're wrong, Mr. Holmes. I. I was the murderer. Oh, no, Michael. You mustn't sacrifice yourself for I me. I think this little play acting has gone far enough. Mr. Corcoran, you have just offered us what you think we will accept as a false confession. But I've established the one thing I wish to know. That you love your late partner's wife and she you. I'm proud to admit that, Mr. Holmes. And now that she's a widow, I can see it in the open. But what are you implying? That you murdered your partner. But, but the grease on your own boots, sir. I just found a jar of it, Mrs. Hankin's oh, handbag. Oh, that, my dear sergeant, was all part of my little plan. As to the grease on my boots, I confess I placed it there myself. Just as I planted the jar of grease in your bag, Mrs. But why, Hankin. Holmes? A fraud accomplished... Two ends. It forced you, Mr. Corcoran, into a betrayal of your love. But what was more important, it proved from what Dr. Watson's natural reactions were that a man holding the creased boots could not fail to realize that fact at once. You brazenly committed murder before our very eyes, Mr. Corcoran, hoping to appear as an innocent victim of another's plot. Your theory is an ingenious one, Mr. Holmes, but how can you prove it? I can claim that my hands are unusually insensitive, not the delicate fingers of a doctor like your friend. Yes, he's right, sir. How can you prove it? When, uh, with your kind cooperation, Sergeant, 
We find the body of Mr. Hankin and examine it. I shall study his boots. If the grease was applied at the hotel, as it would have been if uh, Sean O'Flaherty had done it, the boots will reveal dust from the walk here. If there is no dust, the grease must have been applied as you grasped your partner's boots with grease-smeared hands, Mr. Cochran. You should know best what my tests will grab reveal. Grab him, Sergeant. Grab him. He's come back, come back. Oh, Michael, don't. Please don't. Goodbye, Molly, me darling. No! Great, Scotty. He jumped off the parapet. Now, Mr. Holmes, you can see that I was right, sir. Wasn't I? What do you mean, Sergeant? Oh, uh, in waiting until tomorrow to get the search party. Now we can be after finding both bodies at the one time. Well, Doctor, that was that was really an unusual story. Uh, even now I get a bit of a shudder when I think of that afternoon at the castle. I don't blame you. Doctor, you know something... Uh, Earlier this evening, I said that if I ever got to Ireland, I'd certainly want to kiss the Blarney Stone, remember? Yeah? Well, I've changed my mind. I'd no more want to hang by my heels to kiss that stone than... Well, just let's forget it. But, my boy, don't forget if you kiss that stone, you get the gift of eloquence. You'd be the most convincing fellow in the world. So? So, well, whenever you talked about Petri wine, you'd really do people a favor because... They wouldn't be able to resist trying it. Oh, talking about Petri wine isn't important, Doctor. The best way to determine just how good Petri wine really is, is to taste it. One sip and there's all the proof you need. That's because the Petri family has developed the art of winemaking to a truly fine point. They've been making wine for generations. And all of the things the Petri family knows about turning luscious, sun-ripened grapes into fragrant, delicious wine have been handed on down in the family from father to son, from father to son. That's why whenever you want a swell wine for any occasion, you can't go wrong with a Petri wine because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes story are you planning to tell us next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you a, a story in which that arch-criminal Professor Moriarty played a most important part. It deals with the theft of a famous painting of a strange night that Sherlock Holmes and I spent trapped in the interior of a giant metal vault and of mysterious bloodstains in an empty room. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, A Case of Identity. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invite you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Bulldog Drummond, followed immediately by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Cerebral Cinema hopes you have enjoyed this movie of the mind.